His word is always truth. And you don't have to be a Bible scholar to handle the word of God. All you've got to do is be a vessel that's willing to do it. And if you're willing, I'm going to give you some clues on how that you, you go about doing that. Because it's all right here in the scriptures. Okay, on how we do it. But when we do this, we've got to understand that we're reading God's word. And some of the things that he put in there is for our learning and understanding on how to do things for him. And we just throw them things to one side and start trying to hunt a nugget in there that we can preach on or give some magic potion out of it to get somebody to say, I believe in Jesus. So the devil believe in Jesus. Amen? But as I read this scripture to you, I want to read it slow as I can because I don't want to miss it. You see, I don't want to miss it. I want to understand what God tried to give me every time that I sit down and read the Word. Sometimes it, it takes me going over and over and over. Five verses right here. I went over this thing so many times. And then when I went over it again just the other night, I got more. I started getting more. Well, last night it was. I started getting more from it. So it started nailing me in on this and me knowing that this was the passage I was supposed to preach this morning. And God does not make any mistakes. I might make some mistakes. You might make some mistakes. But honey, God does not. And if he does not, the Spirit does not make mistakes. If the Spirit of the Lord picks you to do something, that means Jesus is telling you to do something because it's his Spirit that lives within you. And you better know <coughs> listen to what Jesus had to say if you expect it to go with you all the way, even to the end of the world. Amen? So we're going to read some of this and get to it here. Before we do it, I'm going to, I'm going to pray. As for God's anointing to be upon me, I just never <coughs> Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, God, now asking you, Lord, that you just quicken my thoughts. And Lord, help my understanding and my wisdom, Lord, this morning. If, Father, that I can deliver the message that you've given me from my heart not from my mind, that I can take these pages, Lord, and I can take what you said, and I can dissect those and use them, Father, to your glory and the glory of the kingdom, because the knowledge and the wisdom you give me, Lord, the devil has no control over that. He, he hates the gospel, and he will not tell me to preach no word. He'll discourage me to keep me going and preach again. In Jesus' name, again, I pray for your anointing in, in a special way upon this message I'm going to preach this morning. Okay, Luke chapter 5. And it came to pass that the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God. He stood by the lake of Genesis. The people pressed upon Jesus to hear God's word. How many of you know that they were talking to the man that knew all about God's Word? He knew everything that God had in store for everybody here because he was very much alive and in this passage of Scripture. But I want you to notice something very important, and I picked up on this a while back, that he didn't have nobody pinning what he was telling them. He had people to pin what he told his disciples. Did you ever notice that before? He didn't have a message there necessarily for the people who was on the mic. What he had to do was to show and tell. He had them there and he'd give, he'd give them all that they needed to know. The wisdom and everything he had been telling them about was all right in front of him. But then when he, one of the things he did is he, 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 he said, and he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them. And we're washing their nets. That means the minute was one boat, not probably in the other one. <laughs> because we both love to fish. And he entered into one. Oh, wait a minute. And he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and he talked with the people out of the ship. He went out away from the bank. 
And when he went out away from the bank, I pictured this as I've been on Brookville a lot of times, down to the beach or someplace like that. And the beach would be empty and there'd be nobody there. And then I've been down there at times when they were out on the diving platform and everything and just people everywhere. And you take that diving platform and you look at it as if that would have been the boat that Jesus was in. And you're looking in there and you're seeing all these people. All they ever said was that they were running and giggling and having a big time. They were standing on that bank and they were trying to get the words from, the, from, the, from Jesus and the way to eternal life. And no doubt Jesus was giving it to them. But there were so many of them there in order for him to reach them all. He had to get in the boat with Peter, or Simon, and pull off of the bank just a little ways. He could have heard a word. He could holler and or talk to them and tell them on the bank that they were, where they were standing whether they would understand what he was saying. Because when he would get so close to him, they would smother the voice out to whether he could have him just about standing in water because they're trying to get closer. You see, here, here Peter's boat's available. So Jesus gets out there and he teaches them right from that boat. Doesn't say what he taught them. Does he? Look at it. It does not say what he taught him. It said, And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and he prayed to him that he would thrust out a little from the end, from the land. And he sat down and told the people out of the ship. Then when he had left speaking, he quit talking. He was done with the message. He didn't. He didn't keep going with this thing. But what he did was he had some commandments for them to do. Some telling he had to tell them to do. And here's the part where Christians have the biggest problem with today. And that biggest problem they have with today is that going out and doing something that looks stupid. Oh, <coughs> uh, somebody said, well now, I don't know what you mean by looking stupid. I'll give you the perfect example here in just a moment. The disciples had it. When you are told by the Lord to go do something and you don't want to do it, the first thing you're going to do is start looking at the things that are wrong with it. You ain't going to look at it with the body of attitude. You're going to say, I don't know. I ain't going to go out there and show my ignorance. Well, stay at home and make your ignorance show up to, to God. Show that you're lack of faith. But the thing about it is, the lost people are not going to come in this church in the groves for you to save them. The only way you're going to get them in the church is if you go out there and compel them to come into the house of God. That's why Jesus said, go into the highways and hedges, compel them to come into my house. That they can be fed. Sometimes they have to be saved out there before they'll ever come to the house of God, right? That brother, he was saved in yard cell. But he's a faithful member of the church now. Amen. Yeah. He's faithful. Unless he's sick or he has to work. He don't need work in a long time. He can tell that one of his hands. <laughs> but <laughs> unless he's sick or he has to work, he's in this church every Sunday. I was so glad when this COVID got over with, we're better to start coming into church. Rick, you tell me you and him going to hit it off. You know, you're going to love each other. Well, you're right. They pull them apart every Sunday afternoon. Because <laughs> he, he knew that the man that literally walked in the door, I was going to love him because I already did. <coughs> I already did love him. But see, those things that Jesus had for his disciples to do was the things that he told them to do verbally told them to do those things. And we're going to go over a couple of those here in just a moment and we'll go deeper into this. But the example that the Lord has for us is in His Word. And you tell me somebody that goes in our Lord and, and, and prays, Lord, now show me that I'm in the right way. You already know when you're in the right way or not. If you're having to ask him to show you if you're in the right way, honey, you've got to be in, in the wrong way. You need to get that straightened out because he'll keep you in the right way. But I don't, I don't, I don't know about that. You don't believe in God then. You don't trust God. Those that he saves, those he will keep. Those he sends to 
to go teach his gospel, those he will anoint to teach his gospel. You don't have to be a pastor of a church to go and give somebody the word of God. Amen. You don't have to be. You don't have to be a preacher to stand in front of a church and give lessons. He has elders in the churches that are called to do that. You don't have no one to correct people that are handling the word but himself. The reason I'm telling you this is because there's not a one of us in here today that is walking totally by his word 24-7. You're going to mess up. Amen. You're going to mess up. Now I'm going to tell you something. It seems like I do more repent than I do anything. Because I recognize I recognize that every day somewhere along the line I messed up. And that's big, I mean messed up big time with it. I'm ashamed of myself for something I did. It's getting to where it's fewer and fewer between those. Because I no longer say things to people that might be hurtful to them. Amen? When I'm kidding with somebody, they know I'm kidding. They know I'm kidding. They know it's my personality and they know I do it out of love. But I tell you one thing right now. They've been the people who's got offended at me and they got offended at me and I have to go to them and apologize for saying, I'm so sorry. I didn't know that you were that weak. I didn't realize that you hadn't grown in Christ that much. And here they are, 40 year Christians, and a baby in Christ don't pay no attention to them. I've had to do that. I had a guy one time come to me and hadn't talked to him in over a year. Come to me and says, Dan Cross, I'm sorry. I said, stop it. You don't have to go no bother. I wasn't holding anything against you before. When you come walking up over that top of that hill, I'm glad to see you because I still love you. No problems here. He said, sometime I know that's what you're going to say. Him and I ended up joining back up in the ministry again, going to full gospel businessmen and doing some music for him. He was a rockabilly hall of famer. And I love that guy. Loved him and his wife both. But you know, God sends you into places where that you can be used of Him. In full gospel businessmen, I had to do some stuff in there that I didn't really want to do, but I had to do it. And Bob Gay, the one who was over it, thanked me for coming in and saying what I had to say. If He had not woman said, He shouldn't have to come speak. Because He you knows I was going to let the Lord have His way. I love the Lord, I love this church. And what's inside here is the backbone of this church. And what the backbone of the church is, is what God puts in your hearts. And your hearts is a heart of love. I know this church loves everybody that comes in here. If you didn't love the people that comes in here, they would no longer be here. I can tell you one thing. Brad back there, he would never be in this church. The second time, especially after his daddy died, if he didn't know what old Dan Cross would have loved him. If he thought I was one of them ugly preachers that didn't like him or didn't love him, he wouldn't be here. I can promise you that. But you know what? Now when I tell Brad I love you, Brad, he'll say I love you too. If you hug somebody and you say, I don't care if you don't like them. If you hug them and tell them you love them, I guarantee you it ain't going to be too awful long until you do love them. And you're going to love them more than you thought you could ever do. You may not like some of the things they do, but you're going to love that person. I guarantee you. Because it's God's way. It's not our way. i got to get deeper before I get too support off of this. I'm just letting the anointing work now, church. Now, when he had left speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets before it drops. Now, here's where the, the thing comes in. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have told all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. <coughs> now, everybody on the bank it was standing there, heard the Lord tell Peter or Simon, 
launch out into the deep, drop down their net for a drop. Now, these people on the bank, these fishermen have done for all night. They just got their nets clean. They were putting their nets to dry. And he told them, go back up there, let your net down for a drop. Now, we just got these things clean, Lord. The people on the bank was laughing when he told them. All the stuff that Jesus had talked to them probably wasn't adhered to their mind anyway. They just walked run around there so they could listen a little bit. But when he said, let down your net for a drop, they went to laughing because they knew that everybody that fished, fished at night with the nets. Why? Because they'd come in there fishing them feeder fish. It was out there from the heat. And they wouldn't see the net. They'd get tangled in it. You caught the nets. So, when he told them to go out there, the first thing he said was, go out there and let down your nets for a drop. Well, after a man just got done preaching the message that Jesus preached, it looks like that they could just go ahead and do it. But I want you to notice something very careful right here. There was an appointment that was given to Peter and a place for him to go. I need you to take your boat, go out there, drop down that net, and bring in that load of fish. <coughs> These people on the bank need to know that those that are working for me are not stupid. <clears throat> they got sense enough to follow. They are not stupid. But Peter said, Lord, we've been told all night and they caught a thing. You fish at night, not in the daylight, when the fish can see the net. And these people on the bank are laughing while they're tugging that boat out there. I think them folks. They're going to have to do what the man said. Knowing that they cannot catch no fish. In the middle of the day, like, it's quite stupid. You know, all the way out there, they're thinking about how they must look to the people that are on the bank. But when that net hit the water, and those and fish just started swimming towards that net, I believe it was, it was coming to it so fast that you could see them approaching the boat when it was getting in that net. And the boat started to tip over. They summoned another boat to come and help them. And all those fish in that net, they were getting to break. The nets were fixing to break. In the middle of the day. Listen, when God tells you to do something, Tells you to go do something, do it then. They can say, Lord, we'll come back tonight when it's more appropriate. But you know what we'll do? We'll say, Lord says, now, you need to witness that guy right there. He needs to hear the witness. And you say, well, send him over to church, and I'll do it. I'll be glad to just send him over to church. Why? Because you don't want to look stupid out there. Ouch. Did that feel good? Is it the truth? We have a complex because we do not want to look stupid out there in front of the people. And the people that are stupid are the ones that says no to Christ. I've got news for some of those politicians that think they're above the law. Before this thing comes to an end, they'll already be burning in hell. I promise you. You ain't going to see it, but that's what it's going to be. Before some of these things and shenanigans are pulling right now, we have politicians. It's going to be in hell before Jesus comes back. <coughs> We're on, a, on a, an edge right now. I'm going to say this and I'm going to get off of it. I'm going to stay with this. <coughs> when Mavis and I first heard about the pipelines that were going to be closed up, they came to Brookville. Well, when we first heard about that, they were closing them up, and that Biden started being closed right now. I said, I told them, I said, it won't be long after that until there's going to be a gasoline shortage. And I heard this morning they're blaming it on the truck drivers. They got no truck drivers to all of them. 
gasoline. There's going to be a gasoline shortage. It's the reason why that we're in this dilemma again. <coughs> no. That's not it. Air oil. Rockefellers. They're the ones that's called to this. They're the ones. And some of our elected officials, even in the state, have a good chance of already being burning in hell before this thing comes to the end. Somebody says, boy, you're bold in that, ain't you? I sure enough am. So if you don't think I'll tell them that they're going straight to hell, if they don't get their heart right with God, and they can, they can just forget me because I'm going to take something, they're not going to do it because their heart is already too hard, like Pharaoh's was. Turned over to the mind of a reprobate, never ever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. <coughs> the Word of God <coughs> will stand when every bit of this is over with. When this whole life, this whole world, everything is done. Everybody thinks that, well, we've got all the answers now, no, you may. Every time that I read another something, another, I find another thing in the Bible where that I can show you that. that the histories that's in the Bible, and even some of that, don't go back far enough to cover the history of time. Somebody said, well, they was men on this earth back years before they're saying the Garden of Eden was. You don't know when the Garden of Eden was. It's when they said it was. You see, Moses was 2,000 years after it's supposed to have been there. We have no true knowledge of meaning of when that took place. We just know it took place. <coughs> there was a time when it took place. You know, the exact moment, I've been, I was in the altar, I don't know how many times, before I really surrendered my life to the Lord. And I know what it's like to just not go in and just pray and say, Lord, save me, but go in and receive the new birth. When you get the new birth, you're now somebody else. You're not... You're not somebody that can be knocked around because you're a king's kid now. Amen? You can't be just knocked around. And all you've got to do is stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. You don't have to wait to hear from anyone else. Somebody says, Brother Cross, ain't you preaching kind of hard this morning? Honey, we're in the last days. We're in the last days. You know what? There's people all around us that's going to hell and we sit in the church on our blessed assurance. Amen? You know, I've got family that needs to get a hold of the gospel of Christ. Amen. They ain't going to listen to me because I'm praying <coughs> God send somebody. Send somebody that can reach them and get them to whether they will come to you because they need, they already know the knowledge of the truth, but they don't know it in their heart. They know who Jesus is, and they've stood up and said, Yeah, I know who Christ is, and have they be died on the cross for our sin. He said, You, you, you need a new birth. What do you tell Nicodemus? He said, Mark, not I say to you, you must be born again. It means a new birth. Not turning over a new leaf. Okay? Now, he said, and Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Watch what he said. At thy word, I will let down the net. You see, what do you think Simon would have done if it had been the devil telling him? He wouldn't have done it. He didn't say, well, he ain't stupid. But see, he knew who Jesus was too. He doesn't heard him speak. There was enough ministry there. He already knew who Jesus was. He felt the power and the demonstrations of the Holy Spirit while he was talking about the Word of God and talking the Word of God. He didn't say what he was saying to us. But he said what Peter said back to him. He said, at your word, you told me to go do it. So I'm going to do it. You know, at his word, at the word of the Lord, I started out with this. I'm going to finish 
this portion of the scripture with it too. He said that the devil is not going to tell you to go preach the word. He's not going to tell you to go preach the gospel. The devil is not going to tell you to go witness to the lost. The devil is going to do everything he can do to hinder you from going. Why? It's his job. It's his job. Now, if we go over to the fourth chapter, we're going to do some over here. But I want to read one more here, and then we're going to go. And when they had thus done, they enclosed the great mother to the fishes, and their net break. And they begged them to do other partners, which was in the other ships, that they should come and help. You see, these guys didn't take their net and put it in the water. Come and help us. We'll throw fish in your boat. You see, both ships loaded up with fish. They couldn't have come take that many fish in a month, I guarantee you. But when the Lord sends a miracle, it's a miracle. When God sends a miracle out in the church, or out of the church, out in the field, I can tell you this, it's going to start a movement out there with the, those around that sees the miracle take place out there that they'll come to the house of the Lord. They'll want to see what caused that and what made that happen. And when their curiosity will bring them into God's house. And they might even be saved before they even get here. What could be wrong with that? Chapter 4. I think I'm going to cut a little bit short here. Uh, chapter 4. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led in the Spirit into the wilderness. And forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, and I have forty hunger. Now, watch me. It said Jesus was out food and water. Before. It didn't say he was out of water. It said he ate nothing. Okay? You know what it said? Uh, now, being forty days tempted of the devil, in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he had one hundred. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones that they be made bread. And Jesus answered, Say, It is written, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by the word of God. Hmm. How, ma how many of you count on food to eat to keep you alive? Every one of us, right? As sure as you need food, eat to keep you alive. You need the food of the Word to feast on. <coughs> Otherwise, what's the use? If you don't have any promise of nothing else except just walking around on this earth, robbing everybody you come in contact with and leave with an abundance of money in the bank, what good is it here? There has to be something else in this life other than that. <coughs> There has to be something that along the line for a creator to create something that would be something that was holy and pure instead of something that was unrighteous and unholy. Dig in a little deeper than we'll go. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power I will give thee and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me, and whosoever I will, I give it. <coughs> now, the devil said to him, one more time, All this power I will give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whosoever I will, I give it. So, what the word's saying here is that 
The devil has the power. All the power in this world, Jesus is not the one that's holding that power. You see, when the devil came down here, when God sent him down here, he gave him that power. That belongs to him to go out and take it, take out what he can take out because he didn't believe that he, mankind would be that stupid, but he, he knew on a strong end that they would be. Because here they are, they're, they're walking around out there now, and the devil is telling them, if you'll do this, I'll give you power. Do this, and you have all the power in this world. That's how come you're trying to see people today coming up as a dictator. And they're, they're doing it all over the world. Why? Because it's working in one kingdom to where that, that one man's been president or something for, for like 80 years. It ain't that long, but I mean, it just seems like it. And he was a communist, and then his brother took over. And now his brother just resigned. So all those things taking place because somebody gave them the power. You think God just gave people the power? They couldn't, they couldn't abort babies. They have Jezebel couldn't abort babies if it wasn't for somebody supplying the thing there to get it done. Now, if they come at you and tell you they're going to abort one of your babies, you'd bring your guns out, wouldn't you? Yeah. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. You see, the devil still has the power. Watch it again now. He said, And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and glory on them, for that is delivered unto me, to whomsoever I will give it. It has been delivered unto me. That's what the devil said. I have the power. If you will fall down and worship me, he's talking to Christ. If you'll do what I tell you to do, all this power out here, I will give it to you. I mean, the devil, we're talking about several countries. We're not talking about just the United States of America. But I still believe, beyond a doubt, this is my, my vision of it as to what he was telling Jesus. When he took up on the high mountain and he had him looking over, you ever fly out to Las Vegas? I believe that's what he was showing him. I'll give you the power over this city. Think about it. Who do you think is controlling Las Vegas, Nevada? It has to be Satan that's controlling it. It's not, it's not God. So if he's going to give Jesus something, it would be something that would look like it would be something that was pleasing to God, but he knew he was talking to the Son of God. And he knew Jesus was not going to fall for that. If Chick Edwards would say he wasn't going to fall for that bull turkey, he knew better than that. He knew better. But he still had to confront Jesus with that. Now, when... Uh, I didn't look at my own son anymore, I'm going to here, really. When Jesus told us to preach the good news, I've got to find a stopping point here somewhere. I'm getting to be too late in this. But he said, If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. If you just fall down and worship me, I will give you every bit of it. All the power that God has given me, if you will worship me, I will give you that power. How many people do you think of today is selling out to that passage of scripture right there? Bunch. Falling down and worshiping him so that they can have that power. There's nations of people They've been doing it for years. And it just seems like they keep going on and keep going. You say, well, why does thieves keep getting blessed? It's the devil's blessing. 
I'm still being, I'm going to be doing something right. God's still blessing me. Is he? Is it God that's doing the blessing? If it's not God, you're going to know it. Because if the devil's standing there convincing you that the devil is God's, it's God's blessing on your life because of something good that you're doing and you know you're not, you're doing evil. You're not living right. You're not living close to God. If you know that in your heart and you tell me because it's a blessing from God, you know it ain't no blessing because you deserve chastisement and not a blessing. But if you're worshiping Satan, he will give you the desire of your heart. I know a lot of rich people that became rich because of the of the blessings of the devil. That Kentucky Derby that was run yesterday, maybe she's horse, she always, I mean, that them gamblers knew how many times that she was right in that Kentucky Derby and what horse was going to win it. It'd be my, it got our phone to bring off the wall. I know the last four years she's picked every one of them. She picked this one. And he led it from the time they come out of the gate all the way to the finish line. A thousand dollar horse. What the, the man gave for the horse was a thousand dollars. But they had the right trainer on him. That was his seventh Kentucky Derby. Yeah. It paid 12 to 1 odds. I guarantee you, somebody in Las Vegas did not like them odds. <laughs> <laughs> they did not like paying out uh, all that money for 12 to 1 odds. You lay $100 down on, on the, uh, the horse at 12 to 1 odds, and he wins it. You didn't walk out of there for a hundred dollars. So they don't they don't tap. But when you look at the way that the things are going and they're saying, well, God bless me. He blessed you out of grief? I don't think so. I don't think so. Maybe she would say, I don't know how to pick them. You find out how I do it, you go pick it. <laughs> she wouldn't tell them. I ain't gonna help you get rich. Oh, we'll pay you. We'll pay you. Just tell us what horse you think. See, she would already be eating the horse gravy with a devil of biscuits, and she ain't going to do that either. Am I making sense this morning? There comes a time, and we're living in that day, when we got to be at a point where the, the rubber beats the road. There's so many people out here today that's running around with do's and don'ts in God's house. And the Baptist is one of them too, don't say it ain't. We've got rid of a bunch of that in this church. I'm telling you what, when they, they start that year, it's, it's time for me to speak up and say, now, you know what I want to tell you, don't you? Remember about the priest that, that brought the lady that was taken in adultery? Remember what happened there? You sure you ain't in that category? Maybe it's not going home the other day from church. And she got talking about Milk Whaley, the barber down in, in Ross. Friend of mine, ever since I moved to Ross. When I had a motorcycle wreck, he came to the hospital and gave me a haircut. In Cincinnati, he was from Ross. Brought his stuff right down there to the hospital and gave me a haircut. He didn't have to do it. And then wouldn't charge us for it. He said, oh no. He was in our church. And this guy has done so much. In his lifetime, a lot of good he had done for so many people. And everything the man touched turned to money. He never did sell out. He still hasn't sold out. But he was judged and misjudged and everything else around all. He thought I was doing it and I had to rebuke him. I stood and told him, I said, Bill, if I got something to say to you, buddy, I'll set your face. I ain't afraid of you. I ain't said nothing about you. I'll tell you who you are that it was. He come to our church with a basket full of rocks. He said, I got something I'd like to say. I said, have at it. He passed the rocks out to everybody in the church. Me and him invited everybody to throw them at him. 
I'm serious. After he told them, after he told them what was going on, he said, no, throw them at me. If you've got somebody here in the church that you're feeling that way about, then turn and throw them at them too. Have at it. But then when he gave the altar call for them to do, they come back up there dropping them rocks back in the basket. I do out of sight, out of mind. Never be brought up anymore. The man was crazy when he would get to drinking. But he was crazy in fun. I mean, you put one of your buddies at the back end of the boat, went 70 mile an hour down 50, then and the state trooper pulled you over. <laughs> the guy with prostate in the boat. State trooper gets up beside the boat and, he, and Francis stood up and said, Arrest that crazy! <laughs> the state trooper almost had a heart attack. <laughs> Milk was flying with him there. But the thing about it is, it was all over with. He got out of it. But you know, when you get bound on some of that stuff and you can't get, you can't shake it. You can't, everybody won't give you a chance to break even even though you're way ahead of them. That's the part that gets you. They're so jealous. He's now a millionaire. I'd say more than that. <coughs> if he's not, he's bad close to it. Because he's one of them guys that everything that he made, he found something to do with it. He wasn't stealing to get it. Some people thought he was because of the prices he charged for some of his automobile parts, but they paid for it, his price, and he wouldn't steal. I'd have been highway robbery to some people because he wasn't one of those five or nine junk yards that wasn't happy for nothing. But he didn't do all that with his money either. Enough of that. Now, I want to put this into your ballpark today. I cannot figure out a way that I can get tired enough to serve in the Lord, to get tired of His glory. Can you? The glory of God is so unique and means so much to every person. You know, the day that you quit looking at your wife as an old hag. Hello? I hate her more today than I ever hated her in my life. And you start looking at her as something that's a gift from God. And she's here for your glory. She's your help. That makes you want to treat them just a little bit different, don't it? Makes you want to say, before you, you close your eyes and go to bed at night, say, good night, honey, I love you. And you know what? If you're doing that in your house, I'll guarantee you one thing, it's going to show up. Why? Because your squabble won't last no time. I ain't going to say to you one ever. You'll never have a little bit of an argument or something, but you're swallowing it all that little time. You're never going to get up the next morning feeling sorry because you went to sleep without giving her the honor of being your health and suitable. If I go to sleep in, in our house and I need something to, something to be prayed about, I know I can trust Mavis to pray. I know. Her praying never stops. Sometimes she gets aggravated and angry at Randy that she can smack him on top of his head and then range her. And I know it, but you know the thing about it is, the little fella knows he's doing it too. And, and, uh, <laughs> when he's getting on her last nerve, he, he, he knows it is. I know it is. The dogs and the cats, they run from the woods. <laughs> It's not hardly that bad, but I'm telling you, 
They know it. But think about it is, everybody lives in the same space. Everybody has issues. I have issues. Everybody in this building has issues. But those people outside still need us. If we're going to keep waiting on them coming here, chances are they'll never make it. We go out there and try to get them to come in, they'll make it in here. I tell you what, there have been people that's in Brookville right now that's going to church. Because since I've been here to Galilee Baptist Church, I witnessed to them down there. Pointed them to a church to go to. So I'm saying, well, I'm going to come over here if you go to church. I say, no need that, it's too far. Go down here to this church. Go down there to that church. I'm not going to tell nobody absolutely can't come up here. There's a lot of people who got their hearts set on being up here. But if you know they're going to come up here, get tired and move off back down there again and just go right out of church, it ain't going to work. Go back, go into a church down here. Doug Anderson was raised in the Church of Christ. And they stood down there and argued with me, teeth, hair, and eyeball. Said, if you ain't been baptized, you ain't been saved. I said, you need to get back in there and read the Bible. I'm talking to the pastor of the church. I said, the Bible says you must be born again. And the, and the water's not going to be born, born again you. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is what makes you saved. 